Good morning, I'm Paul Jenkins, University Librarian. Welcome to the latest in a series of presentations brought to you by IDEAL. IDEAL stands for Initiative for Digital Education for Accelerated Learning. In May 2018, Franklin Pierce University received a grant from the Davis Foundation to transform our current undergraduate pedagogical practice through the enhancement across the curriculum of digital skills and literacy. Our speaker today is Heather Snyder Quinn, MFA. Heather teaches at DePaul University and has worked as an experienced designer for more than 20 years. Her work focuses on design's potential to transform our personal narratives and experiences and has been presented and exhibited both nationally and internationally. Heather recently received a STA 100 award for her publication, Lost in Translation, which utilizes Google Translate's augmented reality features. Today, Heather will speak to us about design fiction as a method for engaging with radical technologies. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I want to thank Franklin Pierce University for having me. Um, I live in Chicago now, but I'm actually from New England, as I've talked to some of you about. I thought I was still pretty New England, but I stayed in a haunted inn, and I didn't sleep much, and then I drove through dirt roads here and got really lost, and so I'm still like on adrenaline from my morning. <laughs> I feel like I lost my New England abilities, but they'll come back. Um, I'm also happy to be ab among my sports fans because, you know, <laughs> New England sports are important to me. Um, so my talk is called Design Fiction as a Method for Engaging with Radical Technologies. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, this is a body of work that I've worked on for the last two to three years, although in many ways um, it encompasses my whole life, and you'll kind of see that as we go through it. So I'm going to sit down in a minute, but before I do that, um, how many of you know or think you might know what design fiction is? It's a relatively new area. Yes, Chris. <laughs> um, it's the idea of using uh, the, the design vocabulary to sort of speculate what the future might be based on technology. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's a, a relatively new field of study, although in many ways I feel like we've really done it forever. So I'll get into a little bit of background on that. Uh, what do you think the term, and some of you might know the book, uh, the term radical technologies might refer to? Anyone? Or, or an example of one that might be? No. Hmm? Anyone? You can't think of one? Uh, well, I'll give you one example, and then we're going to get into more. So an example of a radical technology might be augmented reality, for example. So, okay, I'm going to sit down. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so this is just a high level of what I'm going to talk about in the presentation today. Um, I do consider myself kind of more of a teacher and a maker than a speaker, so I may engage you throughout the talk. Also where this talk kind of involves some more complicated terms, I mean, you should feel free to ask me about things as we go. Um, it's perfectly okay to kind of interact throughout the conversation. So I'm going to give a very high level about what design fiction is. I'm going to talk about the uh, radical technologies and where that term comes from. I'm going to show you a case study in a project, uh, a project that I've worked on for the last two to three years. I'm going to talk about EDU and industry integration, so how people are beginning to incorporate this into their work. Um, and then um, I'm going to give you a bunch of resources. So. So let's begin. I want to give you a tiny bit of context on my background and experience and how this came to be my path of research. Next slide. So I've traveled many paths in my life, but at this moment, these are the ones I connect with most. Um, I'm an educator, I'm a maker, I'm a writer, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a mom, and I'm, I'm a futurist. You can go to the next slide. Um, I tried to capture this in some kind of a diagram, and obviously these sort of circles and buckets ebb and flow depending on the day, the year, the project. Um, but I do a lot of different things, and uh, throughout the course of my 20 years, they've kind of now come to this place of working in design fiction or also design futures. Um, as part of my work, I teach and I make and I write. I've talked about that. 
Um, and I'm also on the board of our business school, so I work still a lot in entrepreneurship. I had a business for a long time. Um, and obviously, as an entrepreneur and work working with business strategists, we're really, in many ways, molding um, a lot of the future. So um, in the work I'm going to showcase today, I use design fiction to speculate on uh, radical technology, particularly in the future, um, but also in, um, in the present and in the, um, and in the past. So uh, what is design fiction? It is also called a few other things. And in theory, each term is a little bit different. Um, there's also can be called design futures, speculative design, critical design, and discursive design. They're not all exactly the same, but it's kind of like I bucket them together for um, a number of reasons. The term design fiction, um, from my understanding, comes out from around 2009, so it's really only a decade old. Um, if you take the term science fiction and you take the science out and you replace it with design, that's kind of in principle how it came to be. So if you think about it, um, in that way. So, um, and again, there are many, because it's still a new field, it kind of reminds me of the early days of the internet, which I loved because everything was new. So to me, the field of design fiction is still really new and that's what makes it so beautiful because everybody's still figuring out what it is and what it can be and I kind of like, um, I like that aspect of it. So everything I say or, or talk about, it could be different next year and, and many of you may contribute it, to it as well. Um, next slide. So design fiction is um, more fun for me than anything I've ever done. Um, and I've also found it to be um, really amazing for my students. And I find it to be pretty amazing for my students because um, with a lot of students today, they've grown up with standardized testing um, and all this information at their fingertips. So they almost, um, they're often asking how to do things right or the right way to do things. And so I found with um, design fiction, they have less fear about doing things right. Um, and because we, you know they've kind of grown up in a highly templated culture, um, I found that by having them work in design fiction, especially my DePaul students, their work is getting more conceptual and it's getting weirder. Um, because one of the premises of design fiction is that um, the ideas don't have to be plausible. They're just supposed to make you ask questions. Um, and so that's been pretty incredible um, for my students. Um, also, design fiction uh, um, gives us a sense of control towards the future. It feels like we're, we're impacting it. Um, and also, for me, uh, it's really important is it, it helps us dive into ethics or the ethical implications of what we're making. So um, uh, next slide. So let's talk about the term um, radical technologies for a bit. Um, you can go to the next slide. The term radical technologies actually uh, is a book by Adam Greenfield, and he's actually coming to speak at DePaul in May, and I'm really excited about that. Um, if you haven't heard of it, I would read it. Um, it's one of the most influential books I've ever read. Um, and in my opinion, it's a book that everybody should read. Uh, for the most part, except for the chapter on cryptocurrency, <laughs> um, it's, it's pretty digestible, and um, I feel like it really, it changed my understanding of a lot of these technologies, and I, f I consider myself to be pretty aware of things. Um, and it also helped me feel like I had some control over the, the future of how they would be used. Um, next, next page. So in his book, um, he defines radical technologies around these chapters. There's um, the smartphone, the networking of the self, the Internet of Things he calls a planetary mesh of perception and response. AR, an interactive overlay on the world, digital fabrication towards a political economy of matter, cryptocurrency, the computational guarantee of value, blockchain beyond Bitcoin, a trellis for post-human institutions, automation, the annihilation of work, machine learning, the algorithmic production of knowledge, AI, the eclipse of human discretion, and then radical tech he defines as uh, the design of everyday life. So. I knew what a lot of these terms were um, for quite some time, but hadn't really um, been diving into all the details of them. So his book really helped me do that. Um, do, from the audience, do, are most of you aware of what these terms are? Do you feel like you understand them a little, a lot, kinda? Yeah, I mean, we probably all feel that way, right? Um, 
So as a designer, I've always had to put understanding kind of ahead of being able to do everything. And I think that's one of the reasons I've been able to adapt as the world has adapted so quickly. So I'm not a great coder. I'm not a great writer. But I'm always trying to understand collaboration and connections and make sure I understand terms enough that I can have conversations about them. And I think that's really important, especially for students who are entering any kind of space, really, is to be able to um, be able to read and understand terms and then connect with the right people to move forward with them. Um, so um, to talk a little bit more of that, about that, as, as time progressed from pre to post internet, I felt my privacy slipping away year after year in various ways with no, no way out. Of course, when the, the smartphone happened, I think I got one around 2008, and then it's just accelerated um, sooner and sooner. So when I began my MFA work, I realized I could use a lot of that knowledge, um, having been immersed in the space for so long, to uncover, reveal, hack, unsettle, um, and then, of course, as part of that, I also became curious how others uh, throughout history had done much the same. So next slide. Okay. So my work over the past two to three years began to use design fiction to build new worlds. Um, I, and I also began to use corporate tools for my own benefit, which was something um, I'll talk a little bit about and I think uh, many of you might have fun doing, especially the designers. So I would hack Google, create fake online entities, create personas at Starbucks, put secret messages and protests all over Google Earth, and hidden worlds on Street View. Um, and that was part of my MFA work. But it also showed me that I could sort of hack the system that exists for my own benefits. So for example, when the CDC uh, banned those seven words, I used a recaptcha style typeface to get those words um, all on Google Street View at the CDC headquarters, just as a means of seeing what could I do for my end with this corporate tool. I still haven't found it. It's still up there. I'm not showing it to you today, but you can go look for it. Um, and so um, I suppose that it makes sense that my, a lot of my work touched on game design and play because I grew up in a playful family full of athletes. My grandfather was a cryptographer in World War II. So these themes of design fiction, world making, cryptography, all kind of synthesized together in my most rec recent body of work. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the work. Uh, next slide. I'm actually going to pass around, if you can be careful since I have very limited publication. <laughs> um, that's just a sample of the book of some of the um, uh, slides that I'm going to show you. So tra Transparency Past, Present, Future is a body of work consisting of a trilogy book, a film, and an exhibit in augmented reality. These pieces seek to convey themes of transparency, privacy, the value of secrets, family, and design's current and possible impact on those themes. The trilogy consists of research myths that showcase methods of creative obfuscation. These myths showcase human ingenuity for primal need and desire, often against much larger powers, using various forms of human communication across the senses. My lens is in more innovative techniques and often those created by non-experts. The outsider or non-expert serves two purposes. It is meant to make the idea of coded communication accessible and uncomplicated and embraces the idea that innovation in unsettling systems can be done by anyone. Next slide. Um, the experimental film that's part of this work places my family in a fictional virtual universe by superimposing us into Google Street View. So as you get through uh, the slides, you'll see some screenshots of that. And at the end of the presentation, there's a Vimeo leak, so, so you can watch the whole film. I'm just going to be showing you stills. Um, the work captures the speed and absurdity of modern life, a world that is layered with societal, cultural, and ethical implications, including privilege, corporate power, posthumanism, accessibility, inclusion, and privacy. With the overlay of the physical and the virtual and the resulting mix of fact and fiction, the film reflects a mirror of our time and questions technology's influence on the fabric of our lives. Um, next slide. Lastly, I've experimented with augmented reality. Has anyone in here done any AR work? OK, I will uh, gladly show you some codeless apps that you can begin to use it. The work that I'm going to show you was done with um, HP Reveal. It's kind of a clunky UI, but it's a really easy way to you can screen capture your phone um, while you play with AR, and it'll really give you a sense of what AR is really about. Um, so I used AR both on my physical book, which you're, you have around, um, and also throughout campus. So my uh, thesis exhibit was actually placed throughout campus, and you'll see some screen captures of it. Um, and people, I asked people to hack my AR with their own, and so the whole thing broke by the end, and it was pretty amazing. Um, and so all these pieces serve for observation and reflection of design and technology with consideration for the past, present, and future. 
So next slide. The questions I pose in my work are as follows. By looking at themes, ideas, and notions of transparency, invisible, invisible, as well as design and technology in the past and present, can we speculate how our privacy will be compromised in the future? And in a society of full transparency, how humans might react to our own creatively designed obfuscation? Can we use design fiction as a method to instigate, unsettle, and raise awareness for these possible futures and ethical issues? And if so, how plausible do our scenarios need to be? Next slide. How can we as designers use and approach tools as outsiders? It's kind of what I talked about with Google. See these tools in new ways as methods to hack and unsettle. Can these methods of experimentation be woven into the design process as a means for designers to understand and embrace technology without fearing it? How does this help designers move fully into experience design, the senses, with awareness of the future influence on society of the products they create? So this book was just passing around. I did a, obviously a holographic mirrored cover on purpose. And then the longitude, latitude are all the places that I've lived. So obviously that's a reference to Google and our privacy and co coding and cryptography. Um, and so now you can see the inside of the book. And so before I go into the details, the green represents the past, the blue represents the present, and the red represents the future. There's tons of design details in there. Um, the, the X's talk about physical obfuscation of the past. The camouflage talks about digital altered identity, and the red uses DNA code um, across it. The size of the white inside the green um, refers to the book format. The blue present um, is all based around the iPhone format, and the future talks about 360 view. So that's why the, the pages are formatted in that way. And some of those pages also have augmented reality on top. Throughout history, humans have always necessitated methods for hiding their secrets and maintaining their privacy. Their methods of concealment have evolved with time. Despite more advanced technologies and utmost diligence, no secret is ever totally safe unless kept in the depths of one's mind. However, a speculated near future indicates that not even our thoughts are secure. We are on the cusp of the invasion of the privacy of our minds. In the past, we obfuscated physically with materials using cryptography and steganography. Through redaction, the wearing of masks, and the hiding of physical objects. In the present, we obfuscate digitally in the virtual space with false personas, filters, altered data, and encrypted messaging. In the future, I use design fiction to speculate that we will be internally surveilled to the very root of our DNA. As a result, we will obfuscate our bodies, our physical, and our emotional states. Next slide. So throughout the book and as it's being passed around, examples from my past, present, and future myths include the design of hidden messages and quilts during the Underground Railroad, the blinking of Morse code with, the, with his eyes by a Vietnam vet on national TV, teen lovers sexting with emoji symbols, the football coach who created secret sports signals with memes, the 20-something who created 3D fabricated masks to hack Amazon's facial recognition store, and the man who used automation against itself to make more money for his large family. So one of the things with the stories is that, um, at, at least in the past and the present, the stories are based on real scholarship. But I pretended I was the people in these situations. So that's where the fact fiction comes in. So I wrote the stories to be enticing, to help people learn the, the, um, what had happened. And obviously, the future stories have not happened. So there are fictional myths about ways people might use technology. Um, so just to give you some context around that. So the next slide. So this shows a page from the past. Analysis of our methods of secrecy within the silos of past, present, and future allows for deeper inquiry into time and place. If we look ahead 100, 200 years, what might we observe and take away? What are the ethical considerations of these design products and experiences? And what futures can we speculate, dystopian, utopian, or in between? If we consider the continual growth of corporate power, as well as the rapid acceleration of new tech like AI, augmented reality, 3D fabrication, the blockchain, and IoT, if we imagine the collapse of democracy and the takeover of the country by Google, as absurd as it may seem, how would we navigate our lives? Next slide. Um, so now you're seeing a present um, day screen. That image is actually from Snapchat of my daughter and her friends um, tracking their locations. Um, as we move from the industrial age into the knowledge economy and further into the human economy, and we deal with the ever-shifting digital sphere, we face many challenges. As experience design expands into voice, sound, and gesture, the design field requires broad and global thinkers. Designers must work adaptively across disciplines while also understanding the implications and potential of new business models, ways of thinking, and technologies that are layered with societal, cultural, cultural and ethical implications. Um, next slide. So this is uh, maybe the most important section, particularly for this talk. So these are my fictional myths. Um, 
future speculation mix myths. Um, so the whole section is called Rebirth, Exposed Within the Panoptic Spectacle, Heather Escapes into the Sea. The stories are Google.gov, memory engrams, anti-surveillance masks, confusing the biometric scanner, using automation against itself, slander and augmented reality, invisibility cloak, the mommy makeover, cloaking medication, tricking the smart toilet, and teleportation escape. So in each of these stories, I sort of imagined these technologies, how people would use them in good ways and in bad ways, and how they might mask their identities through them. So for example, the tricking the smart toilet talks about a woman who had cancer, and the toilet was put in, this is already happening, these smart devices. The toilet was put in place to test her urine and make sure she was healthy, but then her husband was using a track if she was drinking alcohol. Um, and so the whole point of the story is to kind of show you like there's a pro to these technologies, but look how it invades our privacy. And it's not meant to say they're good or bad, it's just meant to get you thinking, if that makes sense. And so I hope you'll read them. I'll happily give you the Google Drive. I'm not an excellent writer, I will say that. They're more creative than anything. Um, so technology has provided us with more and more data, and this is a blessing and a curse. Data that governments and corporations can use to sell us more items, even if it is under the illusion of convenience and betterment, which coupled with the rise of the right to know has left the human population very vulnerable to the powers of others. How did we evolve to a place where the notion of full transparency is seen as good, pure, and better? As Michael Shudson conveys in The Rise of the Right to Know, Politics and Culture of Transparency, modern transparency dates to the 1950s, well before the internet. These changes brought a right to know into modern life, year-round monitoring of government, and a blurring line between politics and society, public and private. The rise of openness marks a new stage in self-government. Um, this piece here, you can see I created a huge glossary of terms, um, both te technical and not, and some of the terms are my own terms that are fictional and made up. There's also a text uh, message conversation in the back between myself and a, a made up chatbot that I had created. Um, next slide. Some of these changes have been incredible beneficial for society. However, Boyan Chulhan's book, The Transparency Society, exposes transparency's dark side. And he says, behind the accessibility of knowledge lies the disappearance of privacy, homogenization, and the collapse of trust. Wherever information is easy to obtain, as is the case today, the social system switches from trust to control. As total networking and communication run their course, it proves harder and harder to be an outsider, to hold a different opinion. Transparent communication has a smoothing and leveling effect. It leads to synchronization and uniformity. It eliminates otherness. Clearly, the human soul requires realms where it can be without the gaze of the other. Today's surveillance is not occurring as an attack on freedom, as is normally assumed. Instead, people are voluntarily surrendering to the panoptic gaze by denuding and exhibiting themselves. Next slide. So now you're going to start to see some, some pictures of the film. Um, this phenomenon is perhaps not surprising. It was philosophized by Debord in Society of the Spectacle. He theorized the degradation of human life by tracing the development of a modern society in which authentic social life has been replaced with its representation. Debord argues that the history of social life can be understood as the decline of being into having and having into merely appearing. That statement still sticks with me a lot, especially when I observe my 13-year-old daughter on <laughs> social media. Um, next slide. So why does it matter if we live through representation? As we freely display ourselves and our data, we allow corporations and algorithms to understand us perhaps even more than we understand ourselves, including our addictions and innermost desires. We are presented with a curate illusion of corporate choice. For example, who selected the coffee shops on your Google Maps? We become further homogenized members of a template culture as put forth by corporate drop-down menus. Next slide. And these are collected text messages. Um, the smartphone is becoming less of a privilege and more of a necessity. It is only a matter of time before the smartphone can tell if a coworker is lying about being sick or a date finds you attractive. And that could be interesting. Um, by simply utilizing the phone's camera, apps like Neurologic establish baselines, analyze eye patterns, gestures, and body language. These algorithms create a slippery slope towards the reveal of our innermost thoughts. They are essentially a form of mind reading. Speculative research demonstrates a future in which an entire market of cloaking meds will be taken to mask our bodily functions, our feelings at work and at home. While a smart toilet can analyze our urine and regulate medications, it could also evaluate our imperfections, providing data to healthcare providers, insurers, corporations, and spouses. Users think their data is safe, but we only need to look back to the Dutch during World War II to realize what can be done with captured data in the wrong hands. 
We in the Alexa movie? Okay, so then the, in this dystopian ending, Alexa puts my daughter to sleep with a creepy bedtime story about a shark, which actually exists. I found it because I try to find Alexa's Easter eggs. You know what that means? It's these like hidden things you can find. Um, <laughs> drugs aside, concealment techniques have been created and utilized throughout history. In my thesis myths, I wanted to write speculative futures that were considered scholarly, plausible, and engaging, character-driven, and interactive. My desire to make this happen led me to rediscover the works of Margaret Atwood and Latin American scholar and historian Eduardo Galeano. Atwood's fictional works appealed to me for the engaging plots. Galeano, a Latin American scholar, challenged notions of scholarship by writing his myths and stories as if he was there. All the stories are written in the present tense. So throughout my book, whether it's past, present, or future, they're written in present tense. Um, and Galeano was my, my model to show that I could write a thesis that was fact and fiction because he writes about both fa fact and fiction. So in his histories, he talks about a lot of the, lot of the Latin American myths um, that aren't necessarily true. All right, so let's look at the AR. Anyone have any questions so far? I know it's like a lot to digest. Okay, good. Um, and I love the AR stuff. So in addition to referencing models from fields of literature and history, I also drew upon my 22 years working as a UX designer. Uh, though I started working on the design of consumer-facing websites, I eventually moved into the bigger ones that lie behind the scenes. The unsexy, but to me the most powerful. So I moved from designing to Target's customer website, for example, to instead researching and designing their back-end interface for data collection. I moved to consider new platforms for the National Institutes of Health, for MIT OpenCourseWare, and I researched and created prototypes for Health Dialog, a company that analyzes all this data means health data. And that, that uh, trajectory is kind of important for students because um, you, know, you always think of the work you're gonna do as being consumer facing, but so much of uh, the power and the money lies in the things that we don't really see. Um, so the methods I learned here, strategy, ethnographic research, creating of personas, prototyping, as well as turning things upside down, taught me to look beyond the surfaces to the unseen. It is where I moved from the design of surfaces to the design of structures and systems and discovered I had more power to mold a future. Next slide. So um, now you're gonna begin to see just screen captures of my phone ca capturing AR, and I can talk about that at the end if you have more questions about it. Um, so to me, a prototype, which we all do, serves as a mini speculation or a proposal, a design scenario grounded in months of user research, validates pathways, and looks for gaps and opportunities. The prototype, as we know, tries things out quickly before months of time and money are invested. Similarly, the game, field of game studies also serves as a model. The theory of play states that children play in order to imagine future scenarios before the stakes are too high. By playing, we essentially try things out. So prototyping and play serve as models that I use in my work, and probably many of you do too, even if you don't know it. Um, but they're particularly relevant in speculative futures, and so I'm kind of holding on to those methods um, as I pursue more of this work. So again, this is me. Um, so with AR, it's either, it triggers those images either by geolocation or by a trigger image. So like, uh, um, the phone, I set it to recognize that page, and when it, the phone recognizes that page through the app, it reveals an image. So that's AR based on a trigger image. Pokemon, I believe, is only geolocation, or it might be a combination of geolocation and an image. So geolocation just means it recognizes where you are in, in a mapping device, so to speak. Um, so, okay, so now we can go to the next slide. My work explores interaction design, game design, fiction, and design <coughs> fiction. I hack tools and use them in new ways. Um, and much of my more recent work, as you can see, explores augmented reality. AR is a dream for someone who loves hidden messaging. It's literally hidden in plain sight. Um, Pale Antonelli, who's the curator of the MoMA, um, talks about this a lot in Fast Company magazine. She's speaking about AR, but to me, she's really speaking about how we should all be playing with technology. Um, it's, she says, it might be better to come into AR as an outsider because you don't have a preformed mind about it. It's an extremely important moment where no matter what, we have to push through and work on the tech without being too embarrassed about failing. AR needs design. Designers bring emerging technology to the masses. And I would add to her statement that we also have the power to help do that ethically. Antonelli's statement speaks to the work that I make and that I desire uh, continue to create in the future. I may work for two years on failed experiments. I worked on this AR for two years before I could figure it out, but I had a lot of fun along the way. Um, within those experiments, I connect with others, collect knowledge, create, and most importantly, I play without fear. 
I also consider the pros and cons of what we can do. I speculate for better and for worse. I do not really consider myself a technologist, even though I've worked in it um, for so long. And it's funny because when I'm around artists, um, they always say, oh, you're so technical. But I work in a school of computing and they do not think I'm technical at all. Like, it's just funny to be in two spaces where people have completely different opinion about my level of knowledge. Um, but I, I consider myself a curious experimenter who likes to play, hack, break, and speculate. I use tools in ways they are not intended, and I, I hope that you will try and do the same. And I feel that if we were to break and unsettle systems that have become old, stale, and unethical, we need to learn how to fearlessly experiment, embrace unknowing, or see things in new ways. We need to understand technology even if we can't create it ourselves. That's really important. We need to understand technology even if we can't create it ourselves. <coughs> to break systems, tear them apart, and not accept them as is, turn them upside down and inside out. We need to look at their invisible parts, and we need to look at how the effects on hum humanity in the past, present, and future. Next slide. Chris, do you recognize that? <laughs> that's, that's in Vermont. So I'm only showing one. I had like 20 things hidden throughout campus, text messages, and uh, that I was outside. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I understand all the other images you're superimposing. <coughs> mm -hmm. What, what's with the dots? Why is that? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So this app is called HP Reveal. And when you open the app, so that's not my choice. I'm using a codeless design. When you open oh, HP I Reveal, see. the dots basically tell you that it's searching for the trigger image. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Yeah, so nothing to do with me. And in fact, it's, it's pretty amazing because since using HP Reveal, there's now a ton of other apps. Adobe's coming out with one called Arrow, I think. I'm sorry, one more. Yeah. That was all with your phone? Or yeah, just a phone app. And uh, again, I'm happy to share those um, resources with you. God, I'm the worst videographer, aren't I? I need some help with that. It's like upside down and crazy. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I had funny ones in too. Like I had one that was like this event in Vermont, the event in the floor, and when you triggered it, it asked if John Malkovich lived down there. <laughs> so I just like, I like to be, I, I like to be funny in my work too. At least I think it's funny. Maybe it's not funny to everybody. <laughs> so. <laughs> We mean, you should have your students hide it all over campus, hide their own AR. I'll show you how. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, and so I hope my work raises awareness for our power as designers and realizes that we too can function as outsiders, reclaiming our power and autonomy for ourselves and our world, if not now, in the near future. Uh, this quote, as many of you probably know, is from one of my favorite books. It was actually one of the starting points for this body of work. Um, it's from Fahrenheit 451. And it's pretty amazing to read this. My daughter and my husband walk around with headphones like all day, all night, podcast music. And this was written in 63 and it just kind of blows my mind. Um, so it is, it's kind of, and even they talk about the three TVs and she wants the fourth. I mean, I just could read that book a million times. I know everybody's into it now, but always been my favorite. Okay, so now we are through the work. Uh, let's talk a little bit about EDU and industry integration. Actually, before we do that, any questions on what I just showed? We can go back to it at the end, too. I know it's a lot of stuff. OK. Um, so if you're interested in this work and how to incorporate it into your own practice as an educator, a writer, a student, a designer, or an, as an industry practitioner, I've listed some next steps and resources um, to get you started. So next slide. Um, so I actually need to look at this. So um, I really think that, and I'm seeing it happen, I call it design fiction in practice, but it's also speculative design or design futures. So a lot of it has happened in UX and design, particularly in the academic side of things, of course. Um, but I actually just became a chapter lead for a group, and I'm, I have their URL coming next, called Speculative Futures. The URL is actually futures.design. Um, and he is a creative director at McKinsey, and he's really pushing forth for industry practi practitioners to be doing more future speculation in their work. So I'm super, super happy that this organization, which is much like an AIGA, um, is happening from the industry side. And now um, I'm running one of their Chicago chapters. I don't know if there's one in New Hampshire yet. I forgot to look before. Um, I just had my Design Futures class approved. So I just started teaching that two weeks ago. And even though I've been doing some of these projects in other classes, I'm now teaching a full class. You can see them at USC, Carnegie Mellon, RISD has starting to have one. So they are beginning and I have syllabi samples if you're interested in folding it. I really think it's something to be folded not just into design but into many things. Um, and uh, again, design and writing activities, film, 
and I'm going to give you some AIGA resources on the next page. Um, and of course, so thinking about ethics, strategy, foresight, and all of this really um, essentially folds into the idea of world building, or also called world making, but the idea that we can mold, mold our worlds at least in some way. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, you, sorry, you can go again. Um, this summary here, which talks about um, the kind of the purpose of design fiction, comes from the Futures Design website. So again, Futures Design is a nonprofit organization, much like AIGA, which is the American Institute of Graphic Arts. So they're a national chapter with local chapters, and they kind of, you know, organize all the things that happen around that um, that space in both EDU and industry. Um, and so this is kind of how they summarize it. They actually have a big conference coming up in New York City in June called Primer, which if you're interested, it's pretty affordable. Um, you can go to the next page, next slide, um, and keep going. Um, so a couple of things. Many of you may have seen AIGA Meredith Davis just released a whole series of things called Design Futures. So there are a series of research papers. One is a Design Futures overview that talks about the Bureau of Labor and Statistics and the future of design and what they see the pathways to be. And then she has seven research papers around that. I can't remember the titles of all of them, but they talk about all the different spaces of design. And again, I'm saying design because that's my area, but everything she talks about is pretty applicable to really to anybody. Um, so that's a, a tremendous, they're written really well, they're pretty quick reads. Um, they're definitely worth looking at. Futures Design, oh, if they can go back, sorry. Um, Futures Design is the organization I talked about. I think they're two years old. I'm running the Chicago chapter, so a series of meetups. Um, they also have a national conference called Primer, and they have a lot of great resources online. So there may be one in New Hampshire. Um, they're international now and pretty amazing. Lots of collected work um, that's accessible to everybody to look at. Um, and then I just put uh, my two favorite online sources, the Near Future Laboratory um, and the Situation Lab, which is out of Carnegie Mellon, um, are just two nice resources uh, around this kind of work as well. So people who've been doing it a lot longer than I have. Uh, next slide. And then these are, um, most of my favorite books. I'm a pretty avid reader, but if you had to just pick a couple up there, um, the one that's white called Design Fiction, which has been out of stock on Amazon for like two months now, um, Radical Technologies, of course, and mm, probably Speculative Everything, Don and Raby are the uh, practitioners from Royal College of Art that are now at Parsons. So those, if you did pick those and maybe made up, those ones are, are probably um, my top choices for this for this work. So the library could have maybe get them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think there's maybe only one more slide. And again, so this is all my contact info. So if you want to see the film, um, it's still a work in progress. That's on Vimeo. And my persona, my fake name, now that you know it, uh, is Louise Dana. It's a whole other lecture how I came up with my fake persona. You should come up with a fake persona online. Um, you can see the movie on Vimeo. Um, and then also my Instagram has some work. And obviously, you can find me um, at DePaul as well. So um, so that's a summary of the presentation. And we can, how, do we have time for questions? Yeah, thanks. Thank, thanks so much, Heather. That was amazing. Thanks. I'm, I'm very confused, but also very intrigued. <laughs> oh, boy. I, think I speak for everyone. <laughs> All right. um, so uh, let's ask uh, Heather some questions now, and please wait until I give you the mic so that it can be picked up on the video. All right. So who would like to begin? <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Mm -hmm. All right. So I have three things, right? Oh so boy. I have okay. My daughter, my students, and Bugs Bunny. Okay. <laughs> so the first one is so I, I think our I like to think that our interest and our concern about sort of data collection and how it affects society is almost sort of generational to a certain degree. Mm, yeah. Because, because, you know, we've seen it evolve and, you know, come into yep. being and, and understand how uh, intrusive it can be and whatnot. However, I think with some younger generations, hence my daughter, um, there's a certain amount of either apathy or attachment because it just has been. Totally. Um, yeah. You know, it's like yeah. when microwaves first came out, we all stared at it and watched it make yeah. popcorn, right? And then, <laughs> we were going to get cancer. Right, and then right. wondered if we were going to yeah. get brain cancer by doing that. Yeah. You know, now people just use microwaves and don't think about it. Yeah. So it's sort of the same thing. Um, and so in trying to have these conversations with my daughter, it's just a matter of, yeah, it is what yeah. it is. Um, what do you? What's your advice uh, on sort of what they're in? I know. Is in well, it's funny because <laughs> part of my thesis story in the end, I tear a microchip out of my wrist and I go escape in the sea. But for 20 minutes on Thursday, I lost my daughter. She's eight. Someone else had taken her home from sports. I, I'm like panicking, even thinking about it again. And I was like, 
F that, I will microchip her in a second now, you know? Because fear, and and like because, and then I read this article on the Spec Future site I talked about where I, it basically, um, it said that, that exactly that, that microchips are gonna become this thing where someone will start swallowing them to track cancer, and then suddenly there'll be another reason, and then we'll just have, be, have become used to it, and everybody sure. will have it. Sure, well we have these cameras. Yeah, and so I just don't, and that's kind of the part of the point of my stories, like especially the one around the smart toilet, and my dad died of cancer, and he probably would have eaten that chip in a minute if it was gonna make him stay alive. So, yeah, I am i don't have strong opinions one way or another, and I think it's like the biggest thing is just awareness. Sure. You know, with our kids too, like just, yeah. I don't know, I'm not really answering your question. Yeah, I sometimes, I sometimes fear they have to actually see the consequence yeah. of action before they realize it's a thing. Yeah, yeah, I know, I, yeah. Okay, and then my part two is my students, so I have three of them sitting over there. Okay. And they're, they're in my uh, my UX UI class as well and as my like, dad. you like, who's this weird lady you brought? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Why did you force me to come to this? <laughs> um, so they're in my UX UI class, and they're also in my data visualization class. Cool. Okay. Um, and so we talk a lot about sort of uh, human-centered design mm -hmm. uh, and the idea that users are actually humans and you have, sort of have to really uh, d design for the entire human experience. Right. Um, and a lot of what you talk about, of course, it, it depends on sort of what that human experience yeah, is. Yeah, sure. What's your advice on sort of doing, uh, doing thorough and appropriate research up mm. front uh, to really understand sort of who those people are? Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, like... When I, when I started doing UX stuff, um, I, I worked at a place called Sapient, and they worked with this company called eLabs in Chicago. And eLabs was really the first place to do ethnographic research, where, for example, they'd follow a mom around a grocery store and look for opportunities like that were missing in that shopping process. Mm -hmm. But they'd be hired by like a candy company, and they realize, oh, the candy should be at eye level. And so for a long time, that research was sold as like being for the human or for the, but really. Who's that for? Right. You know? So, um, and I guess I guess it's interesting for me when I think back to being a student where I'm such a rule follower in general. I mean, maybe it doesn't seem like that here, but I have to remind myself and my students as you begin, like, t you can always be questioning everything. The methods, the structures, the systems that exist, why they exist, if they seem okay, and just, and if they're not, if they are not, or there's a better way to say something. So, um I don't know, and it's it's really one of my friends who was at E Labs and then IDEO, um, and now she's at a place called Narrative Science. Said the worst thing happening to design firms is they're being bought up by management consultancies, who really all they care about is making profits, you know. Sure. So, um, and I don't know how to fix that. Like Accenture and Deloitte, they're all just going to keep buying places until, and they're especially buying design firms. So, I that's when I, we feel so small. But I think the start is just the awareness of it mm -hmm. and then you should question everything all the time sure. <laughs> i don't know if i really answered your question no, again. That's okay all right and then the last one is bugs bunny okay so so if we think about italian futurism right yeah a lot of the sort of visual vocabulary for that found its way into pop culture you know yeah. flash gordon and then those sort of home of tomorrow cartoons on the looney tunes cartoons yeah. right i haven't thought about that in a while yeah right exactly remember yeah the jetsons <laughs> <laughs> the Jetsons, exactly. Yeah. It all comes from Italian futurism and is sort of right. distilled down to like this cool pop yeah. culture thing. Yeah, oh, I've got to look at that again. So in that same sense, do you see any of sort of augmented reality or robotics or machine learning, which right now is all sort of very mm. deadly serious, mm -hmm. eventually sort of being distilled down into sort of pop culture digestibles? Oh, God. I don't think you know, we we got to get away from it for a couple of days. Coffee to answer that question. Come on, question. you're a futurist here. You should know this. I don't know. And then I'm like, I don't <laughs> even know if I'm a futurist. The guy who runs Spec Futures said the real futurists are all really mad that design wants a piece of it because they feel like we're diluting uh, futurism. <laughs> and um, it kind of reminds me of how I felt when business strategists started doing design thinking. I felt like they were doing my thing, sure. you know. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I design fiction and futures design, you're kind of seeing everywhere now all of a sudden. So it'll be interesting to see if it's a trend or it or it dies or it just becomes like part of the norm. Again, I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but yeah, okay. I'm going to have to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> it was very compelling. You had oh. my attention. Oh, all right. The whole time. Thank you. I mean, don't you? In a way, a lot of us are doing design uh, 
future design in our in our lives yeah. all the time. I mean, you were mentioning it. So, I mean, yeah. a lot of what you're saying sort of connects with things I see going on every day, the way people use social media mm-hmm. or the way folks put together memes now yeah. to communicate. So, yeah, that's uh, it just the, all, it all yeah. connects very well. And I could see it applying. I'm in political science and mm-hmm. I could see taking some of your principles very easily. Yeah. And I just want to say, and, and trying to apply. Oh, that's cool. You know, I love hearing that. Well, yeah. because politics campaigning, right. uh, you know, I could see augmented reality. Right. Emerging oh, well total. I actually have Googled that recently because um, I wanted to see who, I, I really want to write a paper with a lawyer about who owns AR space. Because you imagine like I could go slander the Trump Tower in Chicago or I could, and one of my myths is about slander in AR. And basically they're looking at law um, for space, underground like fracking law and uh, outer space for who, as a baseline for, I'm not a lawyer as you can see, for who owns that space. So those, like really this kind of stuff applies to anyone because you're just imagining how it might be used and then what could happen, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I think it's... There uh, is a hazard in you teaching design fiction, though, in that <laughs> students might augment your syllabus. Or <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then the history part's interesting, too. I mean, I guess it's technically probably what's called... It was called revisionist histories, right? So I call it, like, revi- uh, speculative past, but I think it's kind of the same thing, right? I don't know. I'm not a historian, so... Yeah. Go ahead. Do you ever consider... Um, the digital divide when you're working in design fiction and whether or not um, technology is creating, you know, a, um, a cast system. Oh yeah, that's interesting. So um, teaching at DePaul is interesting. So I, re- I originally taught at RISD, which is a small, really good art school and it feels like everybody has a lot of money and you never have to question how much you p- spend, have students spend on supplies. When I went to DePaul, we have a lot of first generation college students. Uh, we have a lot of commuters working three jobs and it was the first time where they said you have to keep your supplies under a certain amount you can't expect anyone to have a smartphone because i did a lot of and so they supply them um, but what's interesting about that um, is uh, i i worked on two projects one for mit open courseware which allowed all their materials to be um, open to the world and we had to keep that website really uh, small in size so people in third world countries or our developing nations could download that materials pretty easily. And then I learned that the phone is actually much more affordable, for example, than a computer. So it allows people access to technology. Even designers who don't have a computer can be designing on their phone. So I don't know if I'm, again, completely answering your question, but I think about tech, who it's available to and not, and ways you might think, we might think a phone is a privilege and it is, and now it's become, I mean, now it's becoming like you have to have one, but then in a lot of ways a phone is cheaper than a computer, so maybe there's ways through that people can be using tech. So I'm thinking about those things a lot. I don't know if I have good answers for them, right? In Adam Greenfield's book, he talks a little bit about that too. Yeah. Yeah. So I recently wrote a paper on artificial intelligence and superhuman rights. Awesome. So I was just curious if you had a stance on artificial intelligence maybe becoming sentient. Does superhuman rights, does that mean um, like if you're part robot, post-human, post-humanism? So Tell me example, what that means. It's like um, artificial intelligence getting compensation for the work that they're doing. Oh, damn. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and wait, what did you ask me again? <laughs> I'm just digesting that. <laughs> um, I was just curious if you had a stance on artificial intelligence eventually becoming sentient. Um, if we should avoid it or perhaps a possible AI uprising. Oh, gosh. So part of my thesis, my advisor had me read this paper that I can't remember the name of it, but maybe you're going to know where it's basically saying we are already living in a computer simulation generated by AI. Do you know the one I'm talking about? So then I was like, maybe none of this is real, and I'm already part of one of their experiments. I'm sorry. (laughs) This is getting weirder and weirder. So I don't know. You guys are asking me all these questions. I don't. I just need to process. I want to read your paper. Can I read it? Sure. Okay. That sounds amazing. I didn't answer your question. <laughs> you just intrigued me. Yeah. So uh, in looking through your book, um, yes. I, I wouldn't necessarily call it dark, but there's a <laughs> oh, lot. Oh no. <laughs> there's a lot. A lot of stories about hidden messages. How yeah. to hide, How to trick things. How to 
you yeah. know it, it all seems to be like beware <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, is that your message or are you uh, no you know um that's a really great question this work is still pretty new to me and i think um like and even in writing this futures class I just think it's fun to write dystopian things, but my students were like, can we write some utopian things? And I was like, fine. Um, so I, <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. I think, I think in the time of writing this book, I was really interested in how um, people had risen against bigger powers than them with these various forms of communication, right? Um, and so I suppose the stories ended up dark, but in my mind, it showed ways that they overcame things that maybe were dark I haven't I haven't thought about it I, a lot um, but in reality um, you know the whole idea of this work is to make a better world right um, maybe I just like the dark side <laughs> I have to think about that too yeah hi I do history and so when Frank was asking you and yeah relation to political science i was thinking there is application i can see ways yeah you know, that this work can kind of map backwards into mm -hmm. historical scenarios and yeah i do a lot of role playing oh i love that in the classroom yeah. so yeah. i could see like a speculative mm -hmm. dimension to that yeah. but i i wanted to ask you and i'm not sure how to kind of following on from from what chris uh, started with mm -hmm. Uh, I have a daughter who's 16 and she's long been on a whole bunch of social media, yeah. not everything, but like a limited, but mm -hmm. she had from the age of eight, maybe nine, she had multiple fake accounts. Oh, the Instagram, the the Instagram, place. Instagram yeah. right. Now yeah. nobody ever, we, her parents certainly never, <laughs> Yeah. first of all, knew <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or, or even suggested anything like that to her. So that's that she came into that in her yeah. world view and her environment and i guess i'm kind of wondering if we're if we will say a, a faculty member who is not the same generation as, as students obviously a, right. a couple of generations removed can we learn how to think the way they approach mm. your material can, yeah I can mean, we get to that place i mean i'm not confident i can but uh yeah if i know to understand bit. their mindset around tech yeah yeah, yeah. i mean like that's the beautiful part about collaboration right like if you were to write a research paper with them or or do a yeah. presentation together and uh -huh. um yeah i mean i think just when you said you're a rule follower that kind of thing like yeah i would be that too yeah you know i um <laughs> an example i i sat on a peloton bike in a gym <laughs> and you have to have a login so i put kelly mc you know and next yeah. thing i see everyone's called you know fast <laughs> you know, they're all i totally get names. that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know for me <laughs> i feel like it's just yeah. i mean again i don't know it could be i don't know if it's a generational thing a gender thing a way we were raised thing like one of the very first design pro fiction projects I did is one of my advisors told me I, sh I needed to develop a persona so I could find evil Heather because I was too good. <laughs> Chris is probably laughing back there if he can figure out who it is. And um, I so I decided I would go to Starbucks and I'd give them a different name every time I went and then I'd keep the cups with my names on them. And I tried all kinds of names, Rainbow, Paige, Sage, Rachel, Kate. But uh, the first few times I did it, I was waiting for my coffee because I was expecting them to say Heather. I'd be like, do you have my coffee? It's for Heather. And they'd be like, no, I have one for Rachel. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's mine. <laughs> so there's like a lot of that's like role playing, too. So there's a lot of like funny ways to get started with with I don't know. And it was funny. It was fun. I don't know. So um, to break the rule following. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I don't think I'm answering anyone's questions. I'm just <laughs> babbling on. There are no easy answers. OK, no, <laughs> no there fine. aren't. Yeah. How do you feel about like the going on after what she said mm -hmm. about the difference between how a younger generation thinks rather than your generation? How do you think that would help with what this is? Like how do you think that mm. the openness that this younger generation has yeah. with like almost like a communication with like we have memes in like most 
adults are like, what is that? I don't understand yeah. that at yeah. all, the concept around it. How do you yeah. feel about that? Um, I think it's just awareness and open-mindedness. I mean, the beautiful thing about memes, once you study them, them is it's given the ability, of, now anyone can make a design. And the badness of memes is kind of great because people can get these messages, visual messages across really quickly. So I haven't studied a lot on meme culture, but I mean, for example, my daughters want me to watch Vines. They think Vines are the funniest things, and I laugh, but I don't. And they're and they they're, they follow vloggers, right? Am I saying that right? Video bloggers, and sh they'll watch them for hours. And I, I mean, I'm kind of okay with it, even though I would never do it, watch it or do it. So I just think opening the dialogue and I mean, and there's plenty of things we do in our generation that maybe aren't okay that my kid will tell me about too. So, I mean, I just, no easy answer, just awareness and communication and collaboration, I think, right? So, um, the, yeah. The, uh, the, the threads are there though, right? Like historically the threads are there. Like yeah. I look at memes and I think, well, these are not a lot different than like photocopied zines. True. Yeah. Right. You know, if you yeah. think about zines from the '80s, where you're yeah. literally ripping things up yeah. in pieces, collaging, photo, yeah, collaging, yeah it, totally, copying it back together again, just yeah. to make a statement in like a quick format. Of yeah. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah. You're just doing it in a digital form. I know. And then things come back. Like my students now um, are. So I learned that students secretly chat in, in Google Docs. Mm -hmm. that, because we're always going to find a way to protect our privacy or to sneak behind. I snuck behind my parents' back all the time. But students now are doing folded notes again, which I think is so cool. So stuff always comes back. Just like craft culture and lettering came back, you know, hand notes are going to come back. Yeah, sure. People are going to start cheating by writing on their shoes again and things like that, you know. Don't probably, do that. <laughs> probably have time for one more quick question. Yeah. Does anybody want a chance to... Our, Oh, we got one from San. <laughs> um, yeah. So I teach writing, and I'm a rhetorician. And oh I'm boy! Thinking about like all of the different uh, audiences invoked, audiences addressed, mm -hmm. audiences like just changing format and what that does for audiences. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I'm wondering if you have talked with any people that um, teach writing and think through that. No, it's funny. Um, I writing for me is is pretty new. When I, I as a consultant, you know, you're writing pitches and briefs and you know um, budgets and things. And I, I had like a terrible writing experience in high school, where I was a creative writer, and I had a, a professor, a teacher, tell me I could never be a writer. I had terrible grammar, and I just gave up. And then when I went to grad school, um, I started writing like crazy. And one of my advisors is like, "You have terrible grammar, but you are a really prolific writer." And I was like, oh, and I really like writing. I'm gonna cry right now. So I just started writing, I write text message stories and I write, I think the, the thing I'm good at with writing is writing in ways maybe haven't been done yet. Um, and I've kind of accepted that. I now have this friend called Grammarly. <laughs> it's an AI app that fixes my, and it's, you know, I'm sure a lot of really amazing writers would look at my writing and be like, wow, this lady needs some help, you know? But um, I've actually really been thinking about taking some writing classes to get better at it. And because now I'm really interested in some of the things that you're saying or just like, I'm just always have kind of been like a sponge about learning in general. So, I, you know, yeah. and I have the beauty of being a professor is I can go audit so many classes and just continue to learn things. So, yeah. 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 Oh. Oh, I never thought of, and it's the same with tools. When people say, well, I want to be good at Adobe, I'm like, well, that's fine, mm -hmm. but can you just continue think? Yeah. Or, you know, can you, yeah. um, and those, oh, those are the skills that keep you adaptable, because the tools are always changing. I didn't know grammar was always changing, though. Yes. That kind of just blew my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, oh. Yeah, and I'm happy to share the AR, re the other resources, I can send them to you. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I have the link from Heather, so I took down <laughs> everyone's name here because it was an invasion of privacy mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I can email you the the link the, of the presentation that Heather sent me so you don't have to be scribbling down URLs and taking mm -hmm. pictures on your phone even though I was doing it too <laughs> but um, anyway let's thank Heather again for this stimulating presentation <laughs> thank you